yeah. So would, would okay. you just like to introduce yourself to the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Karen O'Brien and I'm a professor of human geography at the University of Oslo here in Norway. And um, I'm also a co-founder of a company called Sea Change that is really working on transformation in a changing climate and how we engage people, um, not just with the solutions, but as the solutions. Right. So we're obviously going to go into a lot of different uh, depths uh, at different points of this uh, interview. But I'm going to start with a with a very big question, and it's because it's very enlightening to people who are who are hearing. What does the word politics mean to you? Well, when I think of politics, I think of it more in a general term rather than like the the whole like kind of the, the mechanics of the political system. But I think about how we collectively um, organize society, how we um, how we you know relate to each other in a way that we can collectively manage ourselves and, um, and kind of to build what matters to us and um, move towards a, a future that has meaning for us. Mm. And, and how are you politically socialized, so to speak? What, what, what is the politics that you're living in and within? Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of, I'm split because I'm, I'm an American citizen and I very much follow what's going on in the U.S. socially and, and you know, about just the, um, you know, the polarization, the, um, the um, yeah, the, the dissolution of a lot of things that really were the good parts of a, of a society. And I'm living in Norway where you have a very different social contract and you have much more trust in each other and with in the government and more of a, um, a solidarity and a collective um, field that that has it didn't just emerge but it was actually fought for through labor unions and you know through people engaging so it's not anything to like take for granted but I, I see the difference that that it makes in terms of especially when you know like obviously people here in Norway still fall through the cracks and are struggling and that there is in a growing inequality and, you know, we have those same issues, but it's just, it's not as, as just devastating as it is in other countries and things. So for me, the politics is really, you know, it comes down to relationships. It comes down to, um, you know, how it, it very much to, our values and our worldviews and what we think is important individually and collectively and how we, how we, you know, how we actually manifest that into institutions, into the structures and the systems that, um, that can then, you know, hold the uncertainty, hold these big surprises and, um, and deal with issues like climate change that are long-term and that are about, you know, reorganizing systems. Mm. So when you're doing your work, um, do you feel that it's political work that you're doing? Yeah, I guess it, it's like the boundaries to me are very, and maybe that's what, what I like geography because it's a very like kind of a broad field and you, know, you have political geography, economic, but I feel that, um, that everything we do, like there's nothing that's value neutral. And so that we are actually, all the work we do is political in some sense. And though I may not be on the streets marching for climate change or, um, you know, like in a political office and things, I think ideas can be very political as well. And the way that we teach and the way that we show up and the way that we act, that, that, that it's kind of a, I guess, a, like more of a, a subtle politics that, you know, that it is almost like politics in practice to help move these um, arenas. So, so for me, that broader interpretation of the political sphere is, is important. And, and then I often think, you know, like, well, perhaps if I were in the US, maybe I would be in formal politics. And I certainly could be in like local politics here, um, more, more engaged. But I also feel that my sphere of influence maybe is, is that meta perspective and stepping back even though I do have strong political views and I do have a political party that I would, you know, support here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've introduced a new word, which I like very much, which is subtle politics. Um, you know, often we make the distinction between, you know, the public and the private, or we might make the distinction between, you know, the political world and, the, and society itself. 
um, mm -hmm. but you've you've sort of almost created a space in which those two can coexist. Could you just talk a little bit more about subtle politics? Yeah, well, I think it's it's. Um, I hadn't really thought of that before our conversation, but I, but I think that it is that it's almost a little bit like like spirituality. It's like, oh, what religion are you? What do you do this? But it's really just how do you show up, and how do you take a stand for what is important to you, and actually shift the conversations and move them in a direction that um, that is um, like that that can help um, is like go beyond that polarized us versus them start moving into like wow what matters who decides whose values count and and really you know like approaching you know like engaging with those power relationships and the inequalities and the injustices in a um in a way from you know this angle or that angle that isn't you know like carrying a sign or being like this is my party for you know equality but just to try to bring it open up conversations and bring it into um you know to try to like widen the space for what we're actually um, thinking about um, as possibilities for the future and our role of it. And I think maybe that's where in the formal politics we see there's not much room for people as, you know, besides your vote and your money. And exp my experience from the U.S. campaign, you know, was that, you know, I like, was interested in Elizabeth Warren's um, platform and ideas and, you know, for structural change. But I, all I ended up was getting was, can you donate every, you know, four times a day? So it was more just like, can I give, like my, 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 it wasn't my vote, it was my financial support. And, and that was, it was a little bit like disempowering because I was kind of thinking like, well, I have a lot of ideas on climate change and systems change and all this stuff, but I didn't really feel any, um, possibility to engage in that way and, and at the same time it's just like okay well do that but my real work is trying to you know whether it yeah trying to um, change the perspective on change so that we can look differently so it's a little bit like mm. off the radar from maybe the you know, mm. Warren and the you know regular yeah. politics. No absolutely so I mean you're pointing at something huge there um, which is, which is you know, just to give it a top line, it's to do with the participation of people in the system, you know, mm -hmm. that in a way points at a, a new kind of politics altogether, given that, as you say, you know, a very small amount of people are really implied other than as voters or donators. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you could just for a second, you know, shift into your vision of a kind of a new politics that would have all of that could you describe it well I think it would be like that not just people within the system but people as the system and I think it's like if you think of systems as relationships connections that form a bigger whole and that when we and that I think is part of the like what I'm very passionate about in my little subtle politics project is to get people to realize that they matter more than they think and that it is, you know, like that we to, to actually activate that sense of not just individual agency, but collective agency and political agency. And to really, you know, recognize that we have to, um, you know, make some really, you know, shift these patterns and structures that have been going on for a long time that are based on some assumptions about who's valuable, who's not, what's expendable, that we, you know, like, oh, you know, some people, some species are just not considered to be, um, as important as others. And I think that if we start to, you know, bring in the question marks about that and then, you know, getting into that, you know, like, wow, how, how did we get here to this position? What is the, what are the thought patterns or paradigms that led us to this place where, you know, suddenly it's like, you just see it doesn't work. And yet we also see that there is so much that is working, but it's often based on people engaging very differently with, each other with themselves and and it's a it's a different it's like a quality of agency that I think has to um, come out and I and to me that's the um, it's really the mo one of the most important things and I was asked um, a couple years ago by an editor of science magazine that they just wanted to know like oh how do we what's the most important thing that we do to get people out of their cars and everything and I really you know they really wanted to know what is that answer and and what I ended up writing with, and it took me just like hundreds of hours just to think through, is like, is, you know, political agency is the most, you know, that's the key to responding to climate change, you know, because it is, it's in that how do we organize these systems, and it, it, it relates to the personal, it relates to the political, but it then actually influences the practical. 
you've opened up such a huge world there yeah. and um you know i'm i'm definitely in it with you <laughs> so i, I want to make sure that anybody who's listening could get um as, as many coordinates as possible around um you know your work um how you feel that changing pol the political agency of every human being uh will have a direct impact on climate change could you try to talk that through yeah well i think that political agency is so important because it's it's, you know, it's like, it's not just about individual agency, but it's also, it's both and, the individual and collective agency. It's that we are connected to others through language, through meaning. So right now we're reducing people to these objects who are, you know, almost like you are your carbon footprint. And if you sort your trash or ride a bicycle, then you're reducing your footprint, but we're not necessarily addressing the systemic factors, the financial system, the economic systems, the energy systems things and when people start to see those systems as out there and overwhelming that they they really start to like feel that they don't matter and in terms of you know addressing climate change i think we need people to really realize and that you see it waking up all over with you know youth being on the streets and things but i think it's the it's that that idea that um that there are other ways to, you know, that everybody can work, whether it's within their family, whether it's in their football team, whether it's within, you know, their church group, whether it's within their community, city, whatever, is that we are, we're part of so many different spheres and that we have that, that voice. And so, you know, standing in values that apply to the whole, and that I think is the, you know, like what we're talking about with climate change, with biodiversity loss, with um, equality and everything is the integrity of the whole system, a system that works for everyone. And when, when people start to connect those with their individual values and start to, um, you know, work on behalf of that whole, then you, you start to, you know, it becomes very obvious which systems aren't working. And we see that, you know, every single day that there's a lot of systems that just are, you know, we're trying to support them and keep them going, but they actually are not working for everybody and they're not working for the environment. They're not working for the future. So, so that political agency really is to start to recognize that, you know, like that we are all part, you know, we all, it's like that we are just one big self-organizing system and it's how we organize that is going to determine what type of future and a, a world that works for some people. And then, you know, with some really, hyper modern sustainable cities is not going to work for everyone if you have other areas communities that are underwater or flooded or in droughts or, or heat and things so it's um it's just trying to like help people to like scan out and take that bigger perspective hmm. can you describe so I, I i see i see it as a as an idea very clearly um and in some ways uh you know some of the civil rights movements or the identity politics movements, you know, the, in a way they are waking up to, people are waking up very much to their own mm -hmm. agency and to what matters. At the same time, uh, it's not yet a broadly understood concept. You know, c people imagine having a voice, for example, but when they have a voice, they think that it's a vote, you know, or maybe they, they suddenly imagine you know, digital systems in which they could, you know, vote every day or be in constant referendums or something like that. But I, I sense that what you're describing is quite different from that. Can, can you describe what it might look like? Uh, for example, where you live, how, how might it look like uh, if people had or were being uh, more agentic, if you like, or more, is it a participation issue or is there mm -hmm. something else that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's not just participation, but it's really the conversations. It's the perspectives that people bring to those conversations or mm -hmm. bring to the um, elections and things. And, and, and so it's more like to, I guess I see that politics is like polit politicization is, is more like Paulo Freire's conscientization where you challenge the given, including your own given, you know, like your own assumptions about what's right and what's wrong and who's us and other and, and things. And so to, um, to have that more, um, a reflect, reflexive politics that, um, that is more, you know, like more like even David Bohm's dialogue where you can go into a space without having your own beliefs. And I think that's a practice that, um, you know, so maybe it's also the politics as a practice that we have to get used to, but, but the, the role that you can see in communities and things is where do we create those spaces for that? 
and you know in the work that we're doing you know with schools on you know working with like the sustainability issues and things some schools feel just you know some students um feel very distant from politics you know even though in norway is a very small country and you can almost like you're you know lots of um, politicians are your neighbors and you see you know it's um, very accessible in many ways but i think that that idea that the the formal politics has kind of alienated a lot of people from that sense of agency and i matter slash we matter that we can actually do something here to influence the development and uh, and that brings in issues again of who decides because when you have large developers coming in and taking away your green areas or deciding that you know it's it's um yeah, it, it, you, you do have to address the issues of power and the formal politics and interests and corruption and all of the, all of the things that that are um, surfacing right now. But um, but if we don't shift the conversations and the the manner in which we're approaching transformations, then um, we're likely to just continue repeat. You know, it's going to be systems that maybe look like they're superficially shifting, and you get someone else in in you know positions of power and it goes backwards 10 years or 15 years as we see in many countries mm. so can i invite you just for a moment to uh, think about uh, trump's america um and you know for us in the uk that might imply brexit britain as well or you know but do, do you do you feel that there's some sense from what you're saying that the uh the engagement of more people in a political life even though you know what we're looking at is, is 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 crude and can be very misleading and so on but their engagement in the political life of for them to feel that they're becoming political actors of any kind do you get encouragement from that um i get some encouragement but then i see also people are just saying like oh i don't want any part of this and you know like that they're kind of checking out from it because there's such a polarization and it's not a very, it's, it's not a, the quality of the discourse <laughs> is so um, kind of you know, like rotten. And it's a little bit like the, like more of a brainwashing type thing that, okay, now we've, um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that it has yet the, um, like that, that it's, I feel like it's, it's, it's moved more into us versus them. So the, it hasn't actually been able to transcend and find connections in, in the meaning that, that is maybe the, you know, the yearning to matter that people have and are expressing. And it's just coming out with, um, yeah, uh, um, populism and, and not a very people just kind of buying into this or that and then paying, it's a, it's a politics of, um, as I mentioned earlier, of, of like very much influenced by money. I give money to this, I give money to that, I support that, but not into mattering. Mm. And so in this moment, um, we're in a very particular moment that we're discussing now. I mean, you've got the bigger picture of having worked with climate change for a while. And, but right now we're in the, you know, COVID-19 moment, you know, there's a global mm -hmm. pandemic. What are you taking from this moment? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think it's 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 one of the most interesting moments, and you hear so many people are making the connections between climate change and COVID nineteen. And on the one hand, you know what we what we're seeing very clearly is that the planet responds when we remove stressors. You know, we remove um, the like the real um, almost like um, yeah um, nonstop production, pollution, uh, you know, like people all over and everything. And suddenly you see the signals in air pollution levels, you see greenhouse gas emissions um, dipping down and everything. But, but at the same time, you see that, you know, like that it's what we're seeing that is not because of, of some enlightened, oh, we can actually change things. It's more a failure of systems and that you see like so many people are, you know, their lives and livelihoods are, are, um, being affected and that it's not, this is not the model we want to do, use, but we want to look at the message that comes out of this. It's like, wow, we actually can slow down and, and do things in a different way and affect the system. But what we want to do is, you know, how can we create a world where people and, you know, biodiversity can thrive? And, and that's, you know, 
the, what we're seeing is that we don't have the answers right here and right now. And so the, what, what we do now is going to actually matter. And it's, it's going to be how we actually, you know, open up. And if it's, you know, just trying to get back to business, get as many, you know, flights in the air, get as much oil pumping up, get as much people burning fossil fuels, get as much of, you know, to, to get to what we had is going to be very different from thinking of like, wow, okay, we kind of tested the sharing economy even more, or we've realized that there's, you know, like, what connections are important for us, what relationships matter, how, you know, that like that, that if there's been a little, just a little opening space for that reflection to think about what's important and how we go about, you know, organizing um, or reorganizing society in a way that works better. So, so it's a, it is this moment, but I think a lot of people are, um, are responding, you know, like just obviously from fear because it is um, really scary and uncertain and, mm -hmm. and unprecedented. But, but in that too, we also see that, you know, we start to realize that, um, that there are, you know, like there, it, that it, there's other ways too. And as a global experiment, we can see how different, different responses are going to trigger different types of, um, of wellness in the future. And I, you know, whether we have a healthy planet and um, people or not. Given the, you know, the arena, the political arenas we find it and, um, you know, that if people start to, you know, take their own actions or their own ways of being more seriously as, as being the agency and mattering, uh, given that we don't have um, a political system that can really respond to the subtle shift that you're describing, mm -hmm. how do you imagine, um, and this is just, you know, you, this may not be something that you feel is, is the responsibility of your work, but I'm inviting you mm -hmm. to imagine how that would get captured, or do you feel it wouldn't need to be captured, it would just be a change? I'm, I'm trying to think through from a political point of view whether or not uh, our politics can respond to these sorts of changes that you're describing. Mm, it's a great question and I think that that's um, uh, yeah for not being a political scientist or in mm. that, but my, I, when, when people ask me it's like how do we change the politics I think a lot of it is about changing the politicians <laughs> you know like actually getting people who you know are coming from a space of integrity and you see um, you know, how that, how much that matters, like with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the, um, in the U.S. or, you know, people who can have, who can voice alternatives. Um, and also that, you know, like different movements and different, you know, like the little, um, you know, fractals of change popping up around that can actually feed into those larger conversations at that um political system. And, you know, there's talk now in the United States about, you know, is the, you know, the Federation of States, you know, the United States going to survive this, um, this period, or are you going to end up with like the states of New England, or, you know, like the seven America, ecological nations of America, or whatever they, um, they've been described as before. And, and I think that's, like, it's really interesting to kind of to challenge the given at all times and our own things of like, oh yeah, what if, how could we do this differently? What if we thought differently about um, the way that we've organized society in the past? And in many ways, the way we've organized it right now is a response of a, a very different paradigm. And in this, is, you know, to create that world that we're coming, we might need different ways of organizing that, but we're not going to get there by decree or by, you know, like a, um, the way that Hungary is going or by, you know, this um, authoritarian, I think it's going to be about a larger conversation about what we want. And I think that's yeah. where citizens assemblies and local groups and, and things that, that not to say that then it's us versus them and everything like that, but how do we all align on these, you know, uncertain values that, that are um, like inclusive rather than exclusive and that take, take, um, you know, take the environment not as an externality, but in nature not as out there, but wow, this is us. And this is, you know, yeah. Different. Yeah, based on really just a different view of the world and our priorities. Could you explore a little bit more or just go, just, you know, yeah, just help um, me to understand. When you use the term fractal, 
-hmm. what does that mean to you because it seems that you it seems to me to be a key to how we make mm -hmm. a conversation possible um, and also the key to change you know it's very different from uh, how people talk about you know having one good idea and then scaling it up you know what is, what is a fractal approach to you yeah well, i draw on the fractal approach um Monica Sharma uses that in her um, approach to scaling, but also Marilyn Hamilton in Integral Cities, looking at the cities as a hive and urban fractals. And, and there's others in your own world looking at fractal, poly like these are fractals are patterns, self-similar patterns that re repeat themselves at all different scales. So you can go down to the individual or below the individual to cells or, or something and all the way up to the global or, you know, universal. And, and I think that in, a fractal approach to scaling change, you're actually changing the patterns, which is actually changing the systems then. You're changing the relationships and saying, this is, you know, as I show up in my, you know, myself, you know, if I am integrated, then I show up that way in my family, I show up that way in my job, I show up that way as a citizen of my city or of my nation or of the you know, wider region or all the way up and that you, you're shifting conversations at every scale. So it's not that you have to, um, that you, you know, that you're cutting yourself and saying, oh, I'm only important at this scale, but it's actually that you're contributing to this, uh, a much a larger um, shift. So it's something that it, it's, it's very different than this idea that we have to, um, my voice has to be heard at the global scale for me to have a global influence. It's more that I can do this, and I know that there are other fractals based on those same values, you know, movements that are meeting in Mexico, in, um, you know, all over the world, that there's, it's almost um, in the um, infrared, or as um, um, Anne L. Quarry, who um, has written a book about globalization, justice, and development, she talks about, you know, the kind of like the, the, well, the yeah, the, it's basically off the, off the radar from global politics. It's not being actually seen. It's infrared, it's subaltern, it's, it's um, but it's there nonetheless. And I think when you start as, you know, you'll, you'll start to just see those patterns changing when you put on the right glasses and, um, and start to focus on what's coming up and what's emerging. Um, and then also recognizing how that emergence is being tried to be um, like put down and hidden because by those who really want to maintain the older system. Right, so you're making a direct um, uh, uh, relationship between, in, in a sense, uh, a, per a single person's way of looking at themselves with meeting other people who are looking at themselves in a similar way and in fact global transformation mm -hmm. is that correct How well, I it's not that you it? it's not i mean it's very easy to connect with people who are like you and who share the same worldview and everything but i think mm. it's more about connecting with everybody from recognizing that everybody has you know like that equity you know you do studies of all animals and equity is kind of it's what we're wired for that and the, um, you know, what, what Monica Sharma works refers to as the universal values of that are innate that apply to everyone that like dignity, compassion, it's, you know, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we acknowledge that, you know, certain things are important to everybody. And so when we act on those and recognize those in others, even if um, it's, you know, like it might not, it might just be like you are other, you are a different uh, person, but if you can make those connections from where you stand in yourself and, um, and, and like get away from that us other perspective, then it, it opens up that field to figure out exactly, you know, what matters to other people and how does that, how do you, how do you actually find that common ground? And, and there are, as you mentioned, there's just, there's so many ways of phrasing this and so many models and frameworks and tools and different contexts and things, but it's all, um, I think it's all about this, um, I think as you started that it's, it's, it's about the paradigm that already exists and that is already there. And it's about occupying that paradigm and being that paradigm rather than, you know, there's nothing that really needs to shift, but it's our, our perspective and recognizing that, oh, it's, um, yeah, that it's already, it's, 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 it is that, um, going back to that word subtle, it's a, you know, very nuanced understanding to say like, there's a space where we are connected and just to be able to see, realize that 
space that is, you know, and then organizing collectively from that space that acknowledges the value of the other. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's me. Mm. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm going to keep exploring this. It's 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 going to be no. Um, people will have noticed, and if they haven't, I'm going to draw attention to the fact that nearly all the people that you've mentioned who are in this work and who occupy and embody this kind of work are women. Uh, you've you, you know you've mentioned women all the time and, and as being the, the people who are exploring this particular field and way of talking about politics. So can, can we try to make some connection between um, how women are and relate, how, what their world of relationships may be that is possibly different from um, the public space that we've, that has, that has been the resource of our politics until now. So um, if until now the public space has been built, let's say, by men almost entirely, um, and, po and men continue to dominate politics, could this be, um, you know, uh, the path, if you like, or one of the paths to change if there are more women um, embodying and bringing their relational ways of being in the, you know in the world which one might say has succeeded in communities at the, at the you know base in you know in a fundamental level community the way that communities are held together through care um, mm -hmm. is something that persists even though you know even though there is poverty uh, and there is exclusion still somehow the community care that works for people are that if anything is what stops people falling off the map altogether. So mm -hmm. there is a, and families the same, where, where a family is strong, it is able to hold difference. It is an, inc it is an inclusion of different kinds of personality within a family. Mm -hmm. uh, for, is this an important aspect for you or is this, uh, you know, is this something we should pay more attention to that there are, you know, that we need to have more women in politics or that the way women uh, work in a more relational way, as you as you've described. Is is there an embodiment of this that that really can't be ignored? Yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting question, and I haven't really gone into like gender so much in my work, in mm. except to acknowledge that maybe it's not just male versus female, you know, men men women, but the masculine and the feminine mm. energies and approaches, and that that there's a um, like to to be able to foster that the more relational side of us and the, you know, like being able to reflect on our circles of care and everything. And, and actually to make that okay to be talked about um, as opposed to the, you know, cause we're kind of in these socialized identities of what it is to be male and what it is to be you know, like a, a man and a woman and everything. But I think that that um, the yin and the yang, the more complex that we, you know, like when we start to relate to that, it's, it's almost that we've, um, yeah, it's kind of a, a resurgence of that um, the the feminine and the caring and and as um, as you pointed out on your website too that you know like that that's there's a, a um, yeah there's something happening in politics with women leaders being able to stand up to um, you know like to be able to take in um, complexity and conflict in different ways and that's I think where the power really lies in being able to um, to like step back and not be in our reactive mode, but to be able to be in a relational mode and not that it, but it also takes, you know, using um, like being a, acknowledging power and the way it is being, you know, used and abused in maintaining the old and, and the dangers that are, you know, like that, like many people who are, you know, doing amazing work for the environment at local levels, they're losing their lives because, some people are, um, yeah, you know, it's like conservationist environmentalists are being shot left and right for pretend the indigenous um, groups in the Amazon and things that are being threatened. So, so to be able to, um, to hold that, um, yeah, engage with power in a way that is very effective is going to call for, you know, calling out what doesn't work and pulling up that, the, um, getting that support from a wider base it isn't so polarized and you know looking at the situation in the United States, Brazil, the UK that we've been focusing so much on polarization and, and I think it's that time you know I, I would have really 
you know, I, I think that more women in politics in the U.S. will be, um, yeah, will, will do a lot of good. Mm. So, yeah, in the world of relationship matters, um, and that relationship is more than a line between two objects, can you begin to explain, and we haven't, we, we haven't, uh, brought this word up yet, but I know that it's a feature of your work, you know, the, the idea of a quantum mm -hmm. social shift. Oh, I, I imagine that everything we've said until now is really what we're describing, but could you, could you explore that term? Yeah. Well, I think that like, for me, it's just fascinating because like the, the whole idea like that of like quantum social science and quantum social change, it's, it's, having worked in the global change community with global environmental change and just seeing how, um, how dominant a paradigm, this kind of reductionist, um, how, how, how prevalent it is to actually take a very, um, um, we call it a um, deterministic view that we can model future, that we don't actually bring in the inner dimensions of humans, even if we're talking about complexity theory and emergence and in this language that we've gone beyond, you know, like no one, no one in that community would say, oh, I'm working on classical Newtonian um, um, enlightenment paradigms. It's like, no, we're talking about complexity, but we're not bringing in um, the role of consciousness, the role of us as the system. And I think that, you know, like looking at just the the metaphors from quantum physics and the meaning of quantum physics in its many different interpretations and, and not the least that actually, you know, reality is not what it seems as physicist Carlo Rovelli writes, but we actually don't know a lot. And so there's lots of different types of interpretations and, and that if you reduce it just to the, you know, atomic and subatomic level without thinking of of those fractals of change all the way up that they're, you know, and, and that goes into um, like meaning and mattering from the, the smallest to the largest perspective. Um, I think we're missing something. And to me, you know, it's quantum social change really, it draws attention to maybe, you know, what, what wisdom traditions have been saying for a thousand years, what the, um, the social sciences and the humanities have pointed to what what many people innately kind of understand and know. And so they're like, well, why do you even bother with the quantum part and, you know, reducing this all to physics again? But I think what it's saying is that like, wow, it's maybe saying that the, you know, the, the natural sciences are social sciences <laughs> and that, you know, like it's maybe a way to talk to you know, people from an evidence-based or science-based approach to say that, wow, you know, like, what if? And there are so many other ways of looking at this. It's really to open up an inquiry that is actually going on already. And people working in quantum decision-making, um, quantum game theory, there's, you know, quantum finance, that the, the models and the algorithms that allow for context, they allow for um, decision reversals, they allow for us to be human. And they actually are better predictors of, you know, how, how we act and everything. So all of these um, prisoners' dilemmas, they break down when you start to allow that we could be in relation to each other and change our minds and we're not so stuck on the, you know, like um, win-lose, um, zero-sum game types of things that the rational choice and expected utility and all these things that have been just kind of drilled into us as this is the way humans are is to open it up and say like, wait a minute, that might be the way we've, you know, the individualistic reductionist paradigm has led us to believe that we are disconnected, that we are like marbles rather than like the, you know, particles and waves that the individual and the collective are, you know, like the individual is the collective, we're connected and related to each other. And, and I think that we're missing something that we could tell a whole different story about ourselves from, from this and to, um, to really bring it down to then not to like looking at our models for the future and thinking about how we address climate change by 2030, which is often then that we think we will, you know, it's, it's what the approach we've had is that, oh, you know, and I see this from when I teach that I'm always changing my slides. We have to do something by 2014. We have to bend the curves by 2016. We have to do, you know, like that there, it's always pushing the future off as if politics in the future will happen and get there rather than bringing it to the here and now 
and saying like, wow, this moment matters, how we show up now. And, and that, you know, the politics is personal. It's, you know, it's, it's about our connection, how we, um, you know, are here and now and in the next moment, in the next moment, in the next moment in relation to the whole. So that, you know, like to see ourselves in those fractals, it's, um, and it takes practice then because like we get, um, yeah, you know, we get our buttons pushed. We get, you know, we, we are constantly um, tending to react to what is other than to actually open up that space for, for doing something differently. And so it's a, you know, to me, it just, you know, opening up that inquiry into other ways of approaching change and scaling change and, and to create that quantum leap metaphorically, but even, you know, like energetically where we just suddenly go like, wow, why did we kill each other? Oh, why did we burn fossil fuels? Why did we treat animals like that? Wow. What were we thinking? And I think that's the, um, that there's, you know, I get, I get excited because I think that it's, there are so many people who are there and that it's just this, you know, like the critical mass that we just, you know, put on, you know, take off the glasses and the blind spots that we have and just, you know, this, this really wasn't that hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in many ways, what I'm seeing at this moment in the work that we're doing is that this, uh, you know, this, uh, this, pandemic, this stopping moment, this lockdown moment for the entire globe um, is causing all sorts of new thinking to happen. Uh, there seems to be a divide as ever between the people who are under more pressure than ever, you know, in a sense, uh, either the people who are doing key working jobs or people who are underprivileged and lockdown has caused, uh, you know, some extreme um, disconnection from resources and so on. For some people, it's worse than ever. Um, and then for others, it's a moment of calm where mm. they're forced to stop working and it's giving rise to a lot of thinking. And some of that is the observation of the people who can't do what they're doing. So in a way, this could, this could you know, historically, if you want to project oneself into the future, uh, you know, be a very important moment but as people are thinking about what happens next, you know, I don't know how it is where you are, but in the UK there was a poll and it said something like 9% of people, only 9% of people want to go back to the way things were, right? And yeah. then there was like many, many categories of questions. What, do, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? But in that, so that suggests a moment, you know, where people might be up for a new way of being. Um, if you had a, a curriculum or a set of, um, you know, ideas of how, just coming from yourself, about how we could be different as we come out of this, what would you, what would they be? Can you describe how you feel we could be different coming out of this crisis? That's a great question. Well, <laughs> so it's a really like a, it could open up a whole bubble. Of, um, yeah. But I guess it's 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 also to you know we kind of think about what next as if there's going to be an end to the virus and an end to the crisis and everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really like what now? Mm -hmm. What now? You know, like how do we respond to everything that is going on in the moment now? And and to um, like the what you're describing as this little space for reflection it's it's almost like to to be able to have that um that reflective moment and to me the um when i think about every all the different responses to the um covid-19 the you know the, the whole pandemic it's almost like an amplifier of what is and what doesn't work what works and and you start to see that um like it's almost like if you're if you're already lonely or you know with an insecure income you're even more so now if you're busy you're even more so now if you're you know whatever you're occupied with it's just kind of like blowing it up for us to look at right in the face and then it's like oh is this important to me is that important to me and so that if there's anything we could take forward it's that it's the just to create that little pause and and say like whoa what you know what do we want to take forward into the future what do we want to leave behind maybe sometimes who do we want to leave behind? Because we've had a lot of people who have had a lot of power and a lot of um, 
influence and everything. And it's, it's actually hasn't, um, you know, served, served the larger whole. And so I think that that's the, um, that, that moment of like, where, where, what is, where I want to have an influence. Was I happy with the job I had? How could I actually make the, because it's almost like we've, we've frozen the economy. We've frozen um, everything. And then it's not that it's like there's that they won't exist again, but how, what is, and that for, for me and the research that we're doing at the university, we're really focusing on the how of transformation and not just the means, but the manner. And so that gets back into the quality of like, what is that quality of life? What is the quality of the relationships I want to have? What, you know, if we, if we were able to just step back and start with a, um, a blank slate and also thinking about what metrics are going to matter to us, what do we measure? Is it going to be like getting GDP back to where it was at? And regardless of whether that's for destructive causes and like, okay, we need to produce the weapons again or things or, or that we actually think about like, okay, are there other, you know, what, what is it that we actually need to measure in terms of you know, our collective well-being? And right now borders are, are up and we can't, you know, like this. And there's like, is this, is, do we really want to go back to this kind of localism and trying to reinforce like this, um, our, our own individuality? Or can we think about the, the collective, what's, um, you know, I saw a, a, an advertisement on um, YouTube for the situation in Yemen right now um, for, uh, and you just thought like, you know, we have to be thinking of, you know, health systems everywhere. We have to think about vaccines everywhere. We have to think about energy access, clean air, clean water, all of these things. So, so how do we take ourselves seriously enough as we come out of this and not just look and wait for somebody to create those systems? It's like, oh, where, you know, how do we actually show up differently and change the relationships that matter to us? And, um, and it's not just us as individuals coming up and saying, I decide this, but it's us as collectives, as groups, as clusters, as, um, as, um, yeah, different um, orders of magnitude to create those, um, you know, like what I think would be just, you know, super powerful fractals of change that can actually provide, you know, like move people into an alternative that is already, you know, people have been paving the way for decades, um, yeah. for centuries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's a de definitely a developmental part of that, you know, then, and for me that helps me to think that we've been on our way for a while and now we're getting you know this moment causes us to step into the present mm -hmm. much more sometimes when I when I listen and uh, or and I think it through myself I, I think there's an there's an element of belief in it you know for people to take on their responsibility they have to believe mm -hmm. that it's that that they do matter or, mm -hmm. or, and that mattering is a fact <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and that goes yeah. back to the quantum stuff that, you know, mm. like just, and even like, like Karen Barad's work on, um, you know, agential realism and things that we are mattering in every moment, you know, that, like that, that mm -hmm. is we're collapsing a wave of potential into a reality, whether we, you know, by whether do we do this or do we do that? Do I take the bus or do I drive? Do I choose vegetarian or this? That we're, we're, we're seeing all these different possibilities. Do I, give, you know, like donate money to this campaign or that campaign? Do I show up on the street? Do I, you know, like every, every decision we make is connected with all the other decisions um, that people are, are making. And I think that that the role of beliefs um, in one interpretation of quantum physics, quantum Bayesianism is that our, it's our bets on the system that matter, our beliefs, how we show up. So if we, if we don't believe we matter, that's guess what? We're going to see that we actually don't matter, that someone else is going to feel like that they matter. They decide, they determine that future. And it's going to be like, burn the fossil fuel until it's gone. It's going to be, who cares about species? We'll bring them back from our DNA 500 years from now. You know, it's like, it's going to be, there's that they, they will miss everything that, that, um, that matters to all of us. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that if we, you know, for me with climate change, if we believe that, um, that if, you know, it's inevitable that we're headed for extinction or that it's going to be a four degree warmer world, and that's what we're going to be adapting to and planning for. But if we believe that we matter and that, um, that, and that we actually do have the solutions right here and right now, we're going to start looking at those and we're going to start investing our energy and our attention and our resources in the solutions rather than um, adapting merely to a, a you know, 
something that um, yeah, there's not going to be a, um, a positive outcome for anyone. Right. I mean, so what you're saying here, Karen, and I know that, you know, we've got deeper and deeper, you know, in the course of this and it, it, you're unearthing something, um, you know, as, as we're speaking. And it seems to me now, uh, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a lifelong Buddhist. So this relationship between um, the vast potential at any moment of of our reality and the way that you can in the moment give rise to the reality that you are identifying as the one that you wish mm -hmm. to create uh, is um, is key to everything really um, so, so many people even in the more progressive political movements that I know are on a day-to-day -day basis saying one thing and doing another right mm -hmm. so they believe in a system they believe in a certain kind of behavior they believe in a way of being greener you know protecting the planet but each day they're making decisions that uphold the old way of being mm -hmm. you know so you know they don't think about the food that they're eating they don't think about the transport they're taking well they think about it but they can put it aside Mm -hmm. they put it aside it sounds to me as if what you're saying is that right in that moment they're giving rise or or, or upholding the old reality mm -hmm. yeah yeah, the reality cannot, patterns of, yeah yeah because i think that they're they're patterns of the past and this is very much like you know alfred north whitehead process philosophy that is you know like we, we are processes or Buckminster fuller i am i seem to be a verb that we are always in the you know in that becoming but being in that freck rectal of a section, you know, of a, of a time, um, you know, whatever, a fraction. And, and I think that that's the, the pra where the practice comes in is that because it's, you know, it's just normal and human to kind of, you know, like, because that, that the collapse into mattering is, I think one physicist was saying, it's like, you know, like that, that's, it's like a trillion, trillion time of a sec, you know, of, of a second. And we can't quite, we can't it just looks like we're continuous it looks like it's all like this is the way reality is but when you get to that another philosophy you just go like wow we actually have that moment right now to to you know do something differently yeah. and, and and to be able to get that and that's where i think a lot of there are so many practices whether you know in terms of meditation um coming from buddhism coming from different things of where we can learn not to just react habitually where we can create that space for you know like to to just stop and not react or um you know like in the person um meditation it's you know it's it's not it's like pushing away or pulling towards you the aversion or cravings but just to be treating things with equanimity and i think that opens that space for you know like possibilities and potentials to be more likely to come about it's not to be like naive that we're going to be like, you know, like it's, it's not this like mystical kind of thing that, and then suddenly in a miracle, this will happen and this, everything will be right. It's, but it's, like, no, it's still about our collective way of being that we have to materialize that different future collectively and that it's going to take, you know, like um, the next now and the next now, you know, like it's going to, it's going to take this, um, this process, but it's, and it's not going to be just me doing it, but it's going to be me with others. And it's going to be a, um, you know, that it is a, a process, but that that process isn't a linear process. And I think that's what's really exciting with social change and social tipping points. And there's a lot of work going on now about social tipping points as if, you know, comparing them to the tipping points in the natural world. But I think what was really easy forget to forget is the role of self-reflection, consciousness, awareness, and that, that social tipping points, you know, we have a lot more power to, um, we're not just, our, our um, patterns don't have to just repeat themselves in the, into the time that we can actually say, wait a minute, stop, and or do something differently. And that is why I think in many ways, what maybe what appeals to me also with the um, quantum social change is it starts to have an inquiry into the role of consciousness in, um, you know, in that, um, in the world that we live in. Uh. All right. So this could well be the moment where, you know, religion or spirituality, consciousness, uh, you know, meets 
politics or reclaims politics maybe in some mm -hmm. way um because if we think about the old politics and party politics and you know only turning up once every five years to vote and all of that all of that nonsense mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so far from that mm -hmm. uh that the that the sourcing of a new politics really begins with the understanding uh of that a of that agency and that mm -hmm. you matter and the and every the whole matters mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so even localism becomes globalism Etc. Etc. I mean, it's it does it sounds um, it sounds like on 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 the one hand, from a political point of view, it sounds like uh, a huge educational moment. But on the other hand, you could also say that this is much more where society always has been, but we've never called that political. Mm -hmm. You know, so people have have had their belief systems, and they do have their you know that's actually a much bigger number of people than ever belonged to a political party anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that sometimes, like, if we live, like, kind of reduce it then to the belief systems and things and to mm. religions and things, there's so many, like, things that are just taken as a given that have been, you know, almost like it's been, like, mm. and we teach it at the universities, we indoctrinate people, this is the way things are, and rather mm. than opening up to that um, reflection so that, because otherwise, you know, you see that people are, um, it becomes this belief versus that belief and I'm right, you're wrong and everything rather than getting yep. into like, wow, what matters and what matters yep. and why and what, you know, what is the underlying belief that is contributing to that? And, and often, you know, and, and I think that the, um, the idea that of mattering of, you know, there's so many subtle things that are driving us of not fear of not being good enough, fear of not mattering, fear of being abandoned fear of you know there's there's a whole bunch of things that we collectively share as humans and that we've built up these worlds to protect us against that feeling and you know we want the security we want to you know feel important we want to do this and you know our, um and if we could just um yeah i guess i think it's you know as you said like getting to that deeper level of mm -hmm. uh, of you know connection and caring that we take off all those um yeah, challenge it. I think it is about questioning as much as, um, you know, mm. connecting so that we're constantly reflecting, you know, asking the why mm. and, you know, like, okay. And being, and I guess it's, you know, in developmental psychology, it's going from the socialized mind to the self-authoring mind where you feel like you have that sense of agency to the self-transforming mind where you can actually look at yourself and go, wait a minute, here I go again, you know, because it's, mm. it's Need to fall into that traps of of right wrong and us and other and um, no hope for the future or whatever and so the, and yeah so I guess that's the the process is you know politics as a process of of being in the world yeah that's amazing I'm going to leave it there thank you very much um, uh, yeah uh, the politics is a process of being in the world. <laughs> mattering okay I, I i feel as if uh, this is just the beginning of a lot of conversations karen and i and i'm um you know definitely going to pursue uh, but for the moment thanks very much and uh some some people will be listening to this uh a year from now or maybe two years from now and it'll be very interesting to see what was going on at this moment uh uh, and how it actually did play out after this, after this, uh, after this pandemic. Well, it will never be over. Let's face it. But uh, how, how it plays out from its uh, from it coming to our attention. Let's put it that way. Uh, but anyway, thank you. That's great. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. Yeah.